Senate Labor Committee is called to order. I will note that we do have a quorum. We have a number of members who are joining us online today. Um, Senator uh, Grunhagen is online, as is Senator Kupek, as is Senator Umerver Baton, and Senator Wiesenberg. And then here, uh, checked in, we have uh, myself, uh, Jen McEwen, we have Senator Housechild, and I'm just reading these because we have so many people online, and we also have Senator Dornick here, and um, Senator Marty. So, um, so we do have, actually, even though it doesn't look like it up at the table, we do have um, most of our members here to, to begin committee. <laughs> Very good, and um, we're going to go ahead and change our order a little bit this morning, and, and I just wanna say I appreciate everybody joining us this morning for this Friday hearing, which is not our normal course, but we're um, on crunch time here and wanna make sure that we get these bills um, heard. So we're gonna begin today um, with Senate File 3496, uh, which is uh, a bill that um, is brought to us by Senator May Quaid, and um, Senator May Quaid, I'm just gonna turn it right over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you agreeing, uh, for agreeing to hear Senate File 3496 again. Um, this bill that was before you before, uh, as a reminder, um, required any compensation that was generated from um, content creation online by minors to be put into a trust for those minors to access when they are 18 years old. Um, the bill went to judiciary, and then it's coming back to you for uh, a change. Um, in 2023, the global content industry was valued at 55 billion. In that same year, the United States content creation industry was over 27 billion. So it's about half of the global content creation that generates compensation in our world is happening here in the United States. One of the issues that we're seeing uh, occur more and more is the online exploitation of children, particularly the online grooming and sexual predation of our children. The New York Times recently did an investigation and uncovered that even though children under the age of 13 aren't able to open their own social media accounts, some parents have gotten around this issue by opening and running accounts featuring their children, predominantly their young daughters. These con accounts can generate hundreds of thousands of followers, many of whom are men and or sexual uh, predators and convicted pedophiles. Because followings, bigger followings means better brand deals, which means more money, um, the content that is posted of these young children as young as four um, often is suggestive. Um, children eating bananas, for example, using the bathroom. Um, and it also leads to parents doing things like offering private conversations with their children as young as two, three, four for pay or selling their leotards to unknown people on the internet. In Minnesota, we have had uh, child labor laws for a long time. You can't work in the state of Minnesota under the age of 14 with a few exceptions, right? Delivering a newspaper or nannying, babysitting, youth sports, refereeing, those kinds of things. Um, and so this comes back to the Labor Committee today because we want to ensure that children under the age of 14 are also not working as content creators for money online. And that is um, what you see before you if we adopt the A12 Amendment, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Senator, for the that overview of the uh, a12 amendment and um, so I just want to make sure that everybody is clear and understanding this is the bill that we had heard previously but Senator uh, McQuaid has done some more work and um, collaboration with the department as well in, in thinking about the most effective way for enforcement of these these measures and now brings us the A12 to, to consider for adoption. Um, members, I'm gonna just make sure everybody see, is looking for the paperwork. Um, make sure everybody has a copy of the A12 that they can take a look at. Um, and I'll go ahead and um, open it up for any discussion or questions that any members may have um, for the author. Members, any questions or comments? Yes, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I was just checking the path of the bill. I see it was a fiscal note dropped last night, so just wondering how uh, we're gonna deal with that. Just go to the Finance Committee, or is it gotta go back to just Judiciary because yep. of the um, possible Attorney General pickup tab? Um, my understanding, thank you for the question, Senator Dornick. Um, my understanding is that the next uh, place that the bill goes is finance. Is that your understanding as well, Senator McQuaid? Yes, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh. And then is that the and then that's it? No other committees? I believe it's after, it's made every all the stops that it needs to make after that. Yes. Uh, what, the, what the question about the attorney general or who's going to? Uh, I guess probably general general fund dollars maybe or that will just be decided in uh, finance. I suppose is that correct? Do, uh, perhaps Senator McQuaid has uh, some more information for us. Yes, Senator McQuaid. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Senator Dornick. I think I heard your question. Um, were you asking me who's enforcing this law? The Madam Chair, yes, I was just Senator asking about possibly with the money and possibly having to be out of the Attorney General's uh, fund. Senator McQuay. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dornack. Yes, um, there's two pieces to this. One, when this bill came before you before, we took the enforcement pieces out of the Department of Labor and Industry. And so we wanted to be sure that there was an enforcement authority. And so we put that with the Attorney General in part because um, of the exploitation aspects that could be at risk here. And then also because the um, we just felt like that was the appropriate venue for the kind of oversight we're looking for um, on, on this bill. Okay. All right. Members, any further discussion or any questions for our lead author before we take up the A12 here? Is there anybody online who has anything? I can't see you. I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand online. Um, if any members are online that wish to ask a question or comment, please go ahead and um, either raise your hand or unmute yourself. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and proceed. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, members, would someone like to go ahead and then adopt a move for the adoption of the A12 amendment on to Senator... Um, McQuaid's bill, uh, Senator Pappas uh, would move the adoption of the A12 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the A12 amendment is adopted. And um, I, I just want to see real quick, is there any other discussion that anyone wants to have um, um, <coughs> on this bill now as amended? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and pass your bill on to, to finance. Senator McQuay, do you have any um, any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate the um, quickness with which we're doing this. I, one thing I do want you to know, because I think it's really important that we take pride in the work that we all do, um, we will be nation leading if and when this bill moves on and becomes law. There is um, a very, very robust conversation happening online about the exploitation of minors um, and how it is allowed to proliferate in the way that it is. And extending the framework of our child labor laws to the online space is a very easy thing to do, but we will be the first state in the nation to do so. And it will make Minnesota a safer, better place for kids to grow up. And I'm very, very excited about the work we're able to do here. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. All right, members, uh, Senator Marty moves that um, Senate File 3496 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Finance. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Thank you. Any opposed? Okay. The motion passes. Thank you, Thank Chair. you very much, Senator McQuaid. All right, next we have Senate File 5157, which is brought to us by Senator Housechild. After you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, today I have for your consideration Senate File 5157, a bill that would require a prevailing wage for certain financial assistance. This bill imposes a prevailing wage requirement on financial assistance provided for economic development, ensuring that recipients of this aid pay their, empl pay their employees wages that are in line with the prevailing wages in the industry and locally. This financial assistance includes grants, loans, tax reductions, and tax incremental financing 
Um, prevailing wage laws ensure opportunities for local workers, which in turn boost the local economy. Additionally, they have provided valuable protections for workers and ensured that publicly funded projects are rightly held to standards that align with Minnesota's values and expectations. Most importantly, they protect the integrity of, of the public investment. Thank you, Chair McEwen and committee members for your time, and I believe we have some testimony. Very good. And first we have Jake Schweitzer. Welcome this morning to the Senate Labor Committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair McEwen and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jake Schweitzer and I am the Executive Director of North Star Policy Action. We're a think tank that promotes data-driven solutions to help working Minnesotans thrive. I'm here to speak in favor of Senate File 5157. Um, as I'm sure you all know, <clears throat> Minnesota faces a severe housing crisis caused by a shortage of affordable homes and the problem is getting worse. Um, and thankfully, this legislature has stepped up and last session provided record investments to address housing affordability. And most sources of public financing for affordable housing have strong labor standards, which is critically important because wage theft and exploitation are persistent problems in the multifamily housing construction industry. Unfortunately, two of the largest sources of public financing for affordable housing, Low Income Housing Tax Credits, or LIHTC, and Tax Increment Financing, or TIF, are lacking in important safeguards for workers. So in, no in November, North Star Policy Action released our report called Subsidizing Abuse. And this report named contractors that have been charged with or face allegations of exploitation according to interviews with workers and industry experts. We identified housing developments that have received funding from LIHTC and TIF and are employing the problem contractors that we named. We found that since 2016, workers on 25 projects that received approximately $31 million in LIHTC funding were at risk of exploitation by problem contractors. And since 2018, workers on 14 projects that received approximately $53 million in TIF subsidies were also at risk. In total, over $84 million in taxpayer subsidies have gone to projects employing contractors with proven or alleged labor violations. Um, and, and when we talk about labor violations, in our report, um, we're, we're talking about things like contractors who have refused to pay their workers, offered them illegal drugs instead, uh, used child labor, threatened to fire a woman for reporting sexual assault on the job, or covering up serious workplace injuries. And if you're a contractor who's guilty of abuses like these, you shouldn't be working on publicly subsidized projects. It's as simple as that. And that's why this bill is so important. Expanding prevailing wage requirements to LIHTC and TIF projects will protect workers on those job sites and across the industry from depressed wages. And the, um, the certified payroll process that uh, goes along with uh, prevailing wage requirements will um, uh, reduce the race to the bottom uh, that often occurs on competitively bid construction projects and also prevent some of these other non-wage related workplace crimes uh, that we see in, and have documented in our report. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Next we have Kyle Makarios. Welcome. If you'd please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, committee members. My name is Kyle Makarios, and I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota State Building and Construction Trades Council. The Minnesota Building Trades represents 70,000 union construction workers across the state who work for thousands of Minnesota employers. I'd like to start off my testimony by quoting Minnesota Statutes, Chapter 17741. It states, it is in the public interest that public buildings and other public works be constructed and maintained by the best means and highest quality of labor reasonably available, and that persons working on public works be compensated according to the real value of the services they perform. It is therefore the policy of this state that, that wages of laborers, workers, and mechanics on projects financed in whole or in part by state funds should be, comp should be comparable to wages paid for similar work in the community as a whole. Uh, Madam Chair, this is the principle in state law for requiring the payment of prevailing wages on projects paid for by the taxpayers, that we should procure the highest quality of labor and that workers who work on projects paid for by the taxpayers shouldn't be paid less than those doing similar work in the community as a whole. I know that this committee has heard a number of prevailing wage bills this biennium, and I also know that you've heard a lot of testimony about the abuses that a lot of non-union workers in this industry face. 20% of our industry is being paid cash off the books or misclassified as independent contractors. You've heard about the studies showing that and I'd be happy to provide them to you if you wanna read them. But those contractors who commit these frauds do not work on prevailing wage projects 
because they can't get away with it. On prevailing wage jobs, contractors have to prove that they're paying the local wage rates and that they're paying above board on payroll legally. Prevailing wage protects workers, but it also protects the good contractors who play by the rules um, and uh, ensure, by ensuring that they won't get underbid by the cheaters and lowballers in our industry. The next point I want to make, Madam Chair, is that prevailing wage will not increase project costs. First of all, most of the project that this, apply, that this uh, bill would apply to would pay the prevailing wage regardless of the law, and that's because the prevailing wage is simply the going wage rate for a craftsperson in any local area. It is built to reflect what local workers are already getting paid. Let me say that again. Prevailing wage doesn't dictate a wage rate. It reflects what the private market is already paying and saying you can't pay less than that on taxpayer-funded jobs. What prevailing wage will do is give a preference to high-skilled workers over lower-skilled ones. It will give a preference to contractors who invest in skills training and apprenticeship programs over those that don't. Uh, and it will reward those who win jobs based on skill, professionalism, efficiency, and productivity over those that pay low wages or cash off the books. Madam Chair, this bill simply extends the state's prevailing wage law to cover housing projects that get subsidized by local tax increment financing. It already covers, uh, prevailing wage already covers most affordable housing projects that are awarded grants or loans from the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. This just extends it to TIF projects. Finally, Madam Chair, uh, I am not surprised to see that Roar's company is on the testifier list today to oppose this bill. Roar's company should be exhibit A in exactly why we need this bill to pass. Roars has developed many properties throughout the metro area and has a troubling history of using subcontractors with a documented history of state or federal law violations affecting workers. For instance, at their Mezzo apartment project in Minneapolis, they used Merit Drywall, which has since closed their doors after the owners were convicted of criminal workers' compensation insurance fraud. Their Riser apartment project in Maple Grove used a labor broker who performed wood framing and has been criminally convicted of workers' compensation workers' compensation insurance fraud. On their Beyond Apartments in Woodbury and Havenwood of Maple Grove projects, they used a subcontractor who was being sued, along with another subcontractor, by the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry for wage theft totaling $1.2 million in back wages and another $1.2 million in, da in damages. The Attorney General previously sued the same subcontractor for threatening and lying to employees to prevent them from cooperating with DLI, failing to keep appropriate employment records, and refusing to, to provide DLI with the records it does have, despite being legally obligated to do so. Roars has also used Absolute Drywall Incorporated, a drywall subcontractor with a public track record of unpaid overtime and child labor violations. Madam Chair, if there's any developer that needs these protections added to their projects, it's Roars Companies. The building trade strongly supports this bill. We uh, appreciate uh, your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next online, we have Shane Lefebvre. I'll make sure that we can hear. Can you can hear, hear us okay? okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. All right, let me see here. Great, thank you. And um, Mr. Lefebvre, if, if you would please introduce yourself for the record and make sure because you're um, testifying remotely that you're speaking slowly enough so that you're, you come across and we can hear your testimony. And if you would also just let us know um, which, um, where you're testifying from for the record because you're appearing online, that would be helpful too. Um, thank you and uh, we look forward to your testimony. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shane Lefebvre, um, Executive Vice President for Rowers Companies. Uh, I am currently sitting in uh, our office here in Plymouth, uh, where I'm testifying from here. And, and just to make sure before I, I go on, you guys can all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you very well and we can see you as well. Thanks for checking. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Rowers Companies, we're a multifamily developer, builder, owner, manager. Uh, we've done a number of projects here with local municipalities that included tax increment financing. Um, to name a few, we worked with Fridley, Maplewood, Buffalo, Victoria, uh, Plymouth, and Chanhassen. And all of those projects and homes 
that those projects created would not uh, have happened without tax increment financing. Um, I strongly oppose the language adding TIF and, and low income housing tax credits as forms of government assistance that would require prevailing wages. Um, if prevailing wages were required, uh, contradictory to uh, what the, the previous testifier had to say, uh, construction con costs would increase by about 10 to 15 percent. Um, this comes from asking a number of general contractors that we work with um, and that I've experienced personally uh, in my career. Um, if you if you take that into a numeric example, 10 to 15 percent uh, at today's cost levels is about 20 or 30,000 per unit or per apartment. On a 200 unit deal, that's about four to six million dollars that you'd be adding to the project cost. Um, projects can't absorb a financial hit like that. And what will end up happening practically is that developers will ask cities for more money, more TIF, uh, or they will further increase their rental rates to try and cover that gap. And that just puts more financial burden on our cities uh, and our renters, uh, neither of which whom I would say need additional financial burden to carry right now. Um, TIF is already controlled and right size using a but for, uh, but for analysis completed by a third party financial advisor on behalf of the city. So there's already controls in place for that. Um, this will dramatically decrease the amount of high quality workforce and affordable housing in the state. Um, it'll hurt economic development, which impacts city subcontractors and renters because TIF is used as a subsidy and an incentive to help development happen. If you create a penalty or a disincentive to that incentive, the result is that less development is going to happen. Um, the lower housing stock will drive rents higher because there's less supply, um, which will then put further um, strain on upward rent increases. Um, the Metropolitan Council estimated the Twin Cities region would need nearly 38,000 units of new affordable housing in 2021 through 2030. Um, this bill would directly discourage new affordable housing development since a lot of affordable housing development does need some form of subsidy in order for it to make, uh, to make it go. Um, I'm worried that this bill is trying to solve a non-existent problem. The marketplace already effectively regulates the use of TIF and the size of TIF amounts given out. Trying to over-regulate it like this will throw a wrench into that system and result in less development and more financial strain on cities and renters. I would urge you to please uh, vote no on this bill, um, despite uh, how negatively we were painted by the uh, previous testifier. I would say that our partnerships have been very strong with cities. Uh, they're very happy uh, with the work and the projects that we've delivered, and we are not out there trying to intentionally hire bad subcontractors or work with people who have bad pasts. Uh, a lot of that stuff must have happened after we worked with those groups. Um, I think we have a pretty strong reputation in the marketplace and with the cities that we work with. So thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Patrick Ostrom. Okay. It sounds like um, that testifier maybe wasn't able to make it today, so may be submitting some um, written testimony. So I think that concludes all of our testifiers uh, for Senate File 5157. Members, any discussion or questions, comments um, for our author? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Hofschild. We definitely do not, uh, we, we appreciate you uh, standing up for the workers, and we don't advocate any uh, contractors abusing workers. Uh, to say that from the start. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was a union uh, carpenter for many years, and uh, so, and uh, had a great uh, career and appreciated it. So, a couple questions, I guess. Well, actually, one. I didn't know if you got to read it, but one of the examples that uh, it does work, and in Greater Minnesota, I think it's going to be more of an effect. And uh, so, there's a. Uh, project in Austin that was market rate, and market rate is, is hard to uh, make work with the rents in smaller communities, and the housing stock is so small, and so I'm just concerned that this will put more pressure, as the previous testifier talked about. Um, and so that's what we, we don't want to do, is uh, cause some of these projects to, to not be built. This was a, 
again, it's in your, I handed it out, it was a 93 uh, unit uh, market rate housing on redevelopment site within the city of Austin that uh, used to be a YMCA and the building was, uh, you know, getting deteriorated and needed to be torn down. So anyways, TIF was a really big deal and even the, um, the, uh, Construct or the developer talked about how close the numbers work and and that's what we're looking at is just again uh, We're trying to make affordable housing and and we continue to, to regulate mandate and so trying to uh, Make that uh, so we can do it Effectively and not hurt have these unintended consequences. So to that point uh, I think it was said 10 to 15 percent. I'm just asking you, uh, what have you heard for the increase in the housing costs of, uh, that this would do? Senator Housechild. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thanks, Senator Dornick. You know, what I would say is that, by definition, the prevailing wage is the current going rate for wages in that community and in that region. And so what we're talking about is ensuring that these construction projects on housing using public dollars do not undercut what the prevailing wage is. Don't undercut what local workers are making. Um, and so I would argue, and I think the advocates would argue, that this in fact does not rise the cost. What we're doing is just ensuring that there aren't nefarious ways to undercut the going rate for the workers that are doing this great work. Senator Dornick. Madam yeah. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Senator Hofstadt. Uh, with the low income housing, they get a lot of um, grants and benefits and all those, and in market rate, they, they don't have many uh, options. And this mm -hmm. was just one that's been so effective for, especially, specifically Austin, as they're mm -hmm. trying to uh, build more houses. Because if you don't build houses, then your communities are not going to last, because the houses aren't going to last forever. <laughs> um, so, and then it's more of a local control, too, is it's, uh, it's their taxes and their tax dollars. There's not a... So just with that, if you wanted to speak to that, how do we um, navigate through this so we don't have some of these unintended consequences? Thank Senator Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dornick. I, I certainly appreciate your concerns and happy to, to continue the conversations um, on, on this bill um, and, and you know, hear more about what, what specific concerns you might have. I think you know, what I know from my experience as a local city councilor, uh, when we would use TIF projects, there were, there were a lot of conversations about the importance of ensuring that we were using prevailing wages. Um, that's very, a very common conversation at the local level, right, that that, that 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 happens. I think what we're saying here at the state level is, look, when we're using public dollars, it is the state's priority that we ensure local workers are getting the rate that they deserve, that is the prevailing wage. So this is just really making sure that across the board we're having this standard for, for these types of projects. Um, and I think you will find that, at least in my experience as a local city councilor, there was a, a tremendous amount of support when we were using public dollars that we better make sure uh, that these have prevailing wage provisions. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator, for that. Uh, so yeah, let's continue offline. Uh, look forward to having some more conversations. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Wiesenberg has his hand up online. Senator, uh, can you hear us OK? Hi. Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We sure can. Yep, we can hear you just fine. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Uh, no, I just wanted to speak about the one testifier. It seemed like they were giving some harsh commenting. Now, I think if you want to be, use union labor, that's fine. If there's people that aren't in a union, I think that's fine, too. Um, I, I, I don't feel like we should be forcing uni unionization on people, and I felt like that was that, that's what that was a little bit. When people are getting fined, it might not be because they're doing anything wrong. The government must, might just be using a heavy hand to say they don't like what's going on. Um, I've experienced that myself when I've done nothing wrong and now the government's uh, suing me right now, even though they said I could do something and now they're saying I didn't, even though I have the proof that they gave me permission. So I, I don't know, that just seemed a little bit uncalled for. Uh, we're, we're saying we need to force unionization and I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Unions are fine, people can have a private industry and that's fine, let's work together and let's do what's best for people. I just wanted to make a comment, so thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, I believe that Senator Grunhagen has his hand up. Senator Grunhagen? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I appreciate the testimony. The thing is, 
I think, you know, a lot of the abuses, it's just a comment too, a lot of the abuses that we're talking about, I believe there's already laws in the books to address those. And that, uh, you know, you can file with the AG, the Human Rights Department, file complaints or whatever. So here again, we're taking a step on a bill to artificially inflate the cost of so-called uh, affordable housing, which is only going to make it more unaffordable. And it's going to hurt the people that you're trying to help. And I just find, again, a well-intentioned bill that's going to have uh, negative results. And, you know, everybody's heard me say this on the Senate floor and in committee. The growth of when you grow government and the cost of government exponentially faster than the private sector and population, you actually do more damage than good. And I believe this bill will do that if, we, if, it's, if, if it would become law. So let's, if there's abuses that need to be addressed, let's pass consequences and statute for those abuses and allow people to file uh, uh, complaints. But let's not artificially inflate the cost of so-called affordable housing, which will actually result in less affordable housing and hurt the people that actually need that help. Anyway, those are my comments. So I, I'm on the fence, but I, I don't think I can support the bill. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator. And it looks like we also have Senator Umar Verbaten with her hand up. Senator, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Senator Hostel, for bringing forward the bill. I also want to thank the testifiers who did such a great job explaining the importance of having prevailing wage on TIF. Um, these are these are the prices. These are the wages that folks are supposed to be paid, and that's the actual cost of this labor. And for us to, as a government, not be um, not be holding these folks accountable for that exploitation. Like these are our public funds. We need to make sure that people are being paid the wages they're supposed to be getting paid. I think this is just really common sense. It's the right thing to do. And it's so, so crucial to tackle the misclassification that happens, the wage theft that happens, the exploitation that happens of workers. Um, love this bill, would love to sign on. Senator Hochschild, um, but I just, I can't emphasize enough that like these are the wages, these are the prices, this is what we're supposed to be doing, these are public funds. It's really that simple. Thank you, Senator. All right, I am not seeing any more hands up. Um, uh, Senator, okay, thank you, Senator Marty. Um, I, I, this, the path for this bill actually is going to, we're going to be laying over this bill um, for possible inclusion. And um, I, I, just before I give you the last word, uh, Senator, I couldn't agree more um, with what Senator Umar Verbaten had to say, beautifully said. I also think that there's, um, I know in, in speaking with people in my district, and I also um, living up north near, we're right next to Hen Senator Housechild's district, um, this is an expectation for us locally. And, um, and, I, and I think that when I speak to constituents in Duluth, the idea that this wouldn't be happening, I think actually would be a surprise to many of my constituents. They would already assume that any time we are going to be using the people's money, our tax dollars that we all pay into as a common pot and then decide what we're gonna do with it, if we ever are using that for private developers to make profit off of and to actually gain financially from, that we are gonna have some rules and standards in place about how that's gonna happen. And we certainly aren't gonna, going to allow there to be exploitation that happens in accordance with the use of those dollars or um, making pay lower in a region. Um, I think that one of the things that we heard from one tester, I, th I think I heard the word government assistance, uh, the words government assistance. And I think that's the key thing. This is government assistance. This is the people's money going to a private developer for a public program. So it is absolutely, I'm, I'm surprised we don't already have this, and this is just very, very common sense. I wholeheartedly support this. 
I think it's a no-brainer. Um, but, but and it looks like Senator Dornick also has a comment before I turn it over to you, Senator Housechild, for the last word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to know the path the bill you said laid over. I would think it would go to taxes. Its tip is taxes, so I'm just questioning that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dornick, for that question. Um, my understanding is that at this point we are laying the bill over, um, but it, it may have another, I don't know, Senator Australia, if you want to speak to that in your comments, feel free. Th thank you, Chair McEwen and Senator Dornick. I know that we've talked offline about the path of the bill and about the tax conversation, so I will uh, definitely, you know, we'll, we'll Explore those. I think laying it over now, and then we'll talk about uh, how that how that proceeds. Very good. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we lay the bill over, Senator Housechild? No, I think I you know I appreciate all the comments, and I think what's said has been said, and appreciate that that we're addressing this. Right. I mean, uh, I think you're absolutely right, Senator McEwen, that the fact that this isn't happening um, is is kind of astonishing. I think to a lot of people, and so let's uh, let's fix this and and make sure we're paying workers the prevailing wage they deserve. All right. Thank you very much, Senator Housechild. With that, Senate File 5157 is laid over. Next, I'm going to hand over the gavel and present a couple of agency bills. Okay, I think we're ready for Senate File 5257. Senator McEwen, to your bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, members, Senate File 5257 contains provisions related to subjects under the jurisdiction of the Department of Labor and Industry, including the Contractor Recovery Fund and Combative Sports. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, turn some of these uh, issues are pretty technical, and I'd like to um, turn it over to our expert, um, Deputy Commissioner Kate Pershu. Perchek, and um, who can tell us a little bit more about the bill, and then we'll we'll be here available for questions. Thanks, Ms. Perchek. Welcome to the committee. If you could state your name and title for the record, and uh, please proceed. Good morning, Chair House Child and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kate Perushek, and I'm Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Labor and Industry. I'm pleased to be here today in support of the department's supplemental budget bill, Senate File 5257. Uh, this bill includes changes that modify the Contractor Recovery Fund and the Office of Combative Sports statutes. The first will result in an increase in expenditures out of the Contractor Recovery Fund, and the second is budget neutral to the general fund. <clears throat> the Contractor Recovery Fund, which is funded by a fee on residential building contractor licenses, compensates owners or lessees of residential property in Minnesota who have suffered an actual and direct out-of-pocket loss due to a licensed contractor's fraudulent, deceptive, or dishonest practices. The proposal before you today enhances the effectiveness of the Contractor Recovery Fund by increasing the amount of funds available to compensate homeowners who have suffered a financial loss. The maximum amount a homeowner can receive from the Contractor Recovery Fund per application is currently $75,000. This proposal would increase the maximum amount a homeowner can receive to $100,000. Increasing the maximum payout will allow homeowners to recover more of their out-of-pocket loss when a licensee fails to perform their contractual obligations. The department projects that this change will result in an additional 228,000 being paid out of the contractor recovery fund each year. The contractor recovery fund carries a balance of 9.4 million 
and the projected increased expenditures from this change are not expected to negatively impact the health of the fund. The combative sports changes in Senate File 5257 include technical fixes to the law that passed last year, such as adding rule sets for Muay Thai, allowing alternative rule sets for kickboxing, and clarifying that while youth events aren't regulated by the Office of Combative Sports, they must be regulated by a recognized third party. In addition, proposed changes add basic experience requirements for individuals looking to be licensed as a combatant. These requirements will ensure that the Office of Combative Sports is licensing individuals who have been properly trained to safely compete at both the amateur and professional level. The bill amends the event fee calculation to accommodate promoters who pay a, a flat venue fee but do not sell any tickets. This budget neutral change in the fee schedule will ensure that promoters are all paying the same amount based on a percentage of the revenue they make either through the sale of tickets or through flat rate contractual agreements. Finally, the bill allows the Office of Combative Sports to share a combatant's medical information with the physician conducting pre-bout exams and the ringside physician if needed to better protect the health of the combatant. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Prushek. And members, any discussion? Uh, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator McEwen, for the bill. Uh, just a couple questions on the recovery fund. I know you said the balance was $9.4 I think. Is that correct? And then I missed uh, how much is paid out in a year, um, that one, and then maybe on an average uh, how many claims in a year, maybe, if you have that number, and then maybe what the average return is or what the claim actually is. But... Ms. Prushek. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Dornick, thanks for the question. So we ran some calculations, and between uh, fiscal year 2019 and fiscal year 2023, there were 54 claims that were submitted at or above 75,000. I do have my staff here can, who can speak to the total number of claims, but specifically we wanted to make sure the committee was aware of the total claims above um, $75,000. Um, and so <clears throat> we estimate that there would be 11 additional claims above 70, between 75,000 and the new proposed $100,000 cap with an average additional payout of $20,738 for each claimant. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that, Deputy Chair. Uh, members, any other discussion? Okay, uh, Chair McEwen, do you have any final thoughts? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, I've, it's a good bill, it's important, uh, and I think that our um, department has done, um, as they do, really, really good work to um, move things forward in a positive direction, so I would respectfully ask for your support, and I would move that Senate File 5257 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Okay, so moved. And those in favor, say aye. 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 Oppo opposed? Nay? All right, the motion uh, passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will move forward with Senate File 5266. Senator McEwen, to your bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do have an A1 amendment um, that I'd like to move adoption of. Thank you. That um, just puts the bill in the form that I'd like um, and that the Bureau of Mediation Services would like it to be in for our discussion. Okay, Senator McEwen has the A1 author's amendment. Any discussion? I move its adoption, the, yeah. Those... Uh, Those supportive say aye. 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 Uh, aye. Opposed aye. say nay. Uh, the amendment passes. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Um, Senate File 5266, as amended, modifies appropriations and other provisions related to the Bureau of Mediation Services. And with that, I am also going to turn this uh, bill over to um, Commissioner uh, Villa Real um, of the Bureau and um, who can talk to us a little bit about this bill. 
Mr. Ver I always get your name wrong. Viriel. Rael. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Johnny Villarreal, Commissioner of the Bureau of Mediation Services. Uh, the bill in front of you is uh, a budget neutral proposal to essentially roll identified funds into our operational budget. Um, the purpose is really to eliminate the administrative burden of tracking each staff member's time for these identified areas. Um, the Peace Officer Grievance Arbitration roster that the Bureau administers under 626.892 includes uh, soliciting applicants annually for two roster member uh, positions that when their terms end and coordinating through the Secretary of State's office, uh, reviewing the applications, interviewing candidates, selecting the candidates, uh, and then coordinating the required training that um, they have to have within six months of appointment, uh, and then also facilitating the case assignments that uh, um, come through our office. Um, the other change to the Peace Officer Grievance Arbitration roster is that uh, we are proposing that the Bureau pay for that training. Um, the statute currently has the arbitrator bearing those costs. Um, we are uh, seeing uh, a low number of case assignments coming through for this area. And these arbitrators are dedicating their practice solely to Peace Officer Grievance Arbitrations because that is what the statute requires. They are prohibited from arbitrating other labor relations uh, matters. So um, given that uh, situation, we think it's uh, um, appropriate for the Bureau to bear those costs. We have been coordinating with uh, technical colleges to help with designing what that training looks like to make it uh, more enhanced and more consistent. Uh, with the Labor Management Committee uh, grants, um, we haven't seen a request come in for some time. I believe it was 2017 when only 6% of the funds were requested at that point. Um, in fiscal year 20, we had 10 um, Labor Management Committee trainings that the Bureau provided. Because we haven't seen those uh, services provided through our uh, external stakeholder labor management committees organizations, we did a, a significant upgrade to our training program. Um, uh, staff member Marshall Thompson has an education background and um, we really enhanced that program to the point where we went from 10 in fiscal 20 to 43 in fiscal 23, so fourfold increase um, to our training program. So what we're looking to do is essentially utilize those grant funds and uh, use them towards our uh, internal agency labor management training program. Um, Mr. Chair, that concludes my testimony. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you so much. Any discussion among members? All right, seeing none, Chair McEwen, any final thoughts? It's a good bill. I ask for your support. Thank you. Wonderful. So we will be laying this over for possible inclusion as amended. Thank you. All right. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> your patience. Yeah, for sure. Thank you.